Dear sisters and brothers, salam alaikum. A special salam also to Khal Ilham, which is watching. I have a lot of respect for her. She's messaged us and she said she's watching. I just wanted to send a special salam to her as well. And the rest of beautiful people here and the ones who are watching at home, it means the world to me that I get to share these points with you. Thank you so much for giving me the time to be able to talk to you. Um, today, inshallah, we're going to be continuing the discussion from yesterday on surrender. We'll also talk a little bit about how addictions are formed. We'll lay the groundwork as well for a discussion on anxiety, but anxiety, inshallah, we'll talk about it mainly tomorrow. Today, we'll just lay the groundwork for it, introduction. But most of what we'll be doing today is the continuation of the talk yesterday on surrender, and we'll also talk about how addictions are formed. So, recite the salawat so I can see you're awake, you're not falling asleep, please. Let's do it. Recite the salawat. Allahumma salala Muhammad. Muhammad wa the discussion tonight is very important, but it needs your attention. So I really want to make sure you're comfortable, you're not sleeping. Even if you want to raise your legs, I'll ask people around you not to judge you. If you're feeling like your legs are in a little bit of pain, sit comfortably. Tonight, I'm even going to make an exception. I usually hold my stomach inside so it looks good in the camera. I'm going to let it go, feel comfortable, because we need all our energy so we can focus on the discussion. So feel comfortable, because... We need all of your attention on the points. Yesterday, what were we saying? That what's inside us changes the way we see the outside world. Okay? We said, if I have fear inside me, I will look at the world, and the world seems scary. Fear is inside me. But because it's here, I see the world as a scary place. Or another example is that, if I have low self-esteem, self-esteem is here. But because of something inside me, when I look at the world, the world seems different. So if, for example, I have self-esteem, I look at the world, I look at people in my life, and I feel like maybe they don't love me. Even if they tell me they love me, but still, because I have this self-esteem issue, when I look at the world, I don't see that. So, what's inside me changes the way I see the world. One good way to understand how this works, an example which makes it clear, is if you think about sunglasses. When we have sunglasses and we look through them, the world looks different. If you go outside and look at the sky with sunglasses, the brightness is less, it's a little bit darker, right? The same is also with these glasses. These are not sunglasses, but they're photochromic. So under the sun, they have a tint. They become gray. Now, it's interesting. If I go outside on a day, and it's sunny, and I put these on, slowly, it will change its color. It becomes gray, right? And I can see. Without them, the sky is brighter. With them, it's less bright. It's got a tint, just like your sunglasses. Now, if I know this is happening, it's OK. I know that, yes, my glasses are reducing the brightness of the sun, the sky, everything. But sometimes when I have them on for a few hours, I forget this is happening. I really feel like, no, the sky is this color. And then after a few hours when I take it out, oh, wow, this sky is much brighter. Right? Because I'd forgotten that my glasses are adding a tint. I'm looking through the world, I'm looking at the world through this filter. So, a filter in front of my eyes makes me feel like the world is darker, it's less bright. The same is I'm trying to say inside us. There may be certain filters inside us that we look at the world and it makes it less nice, less bright less life in it. 
An example to show you how this is happening is think of a time, for example, as a parent or an older brother, you're taking your child to a park. The child is enjoying that time in the park, running, playing, always swing. The child is looking at the park and thinking, wow, this is really fun. It's exciting. But the parent, if someone asks you, why are you in the park? Like, oh, just brought, for example, little Yusuf. He enjoys park. The parent is there in the same place, the same park, but she or he is not enjoying it that much. Yes, I brought, for example, little Hassan, Hassuni, to walk. He's enjoying it. He loves park. Now, we as parents or as older siblings, we feel like, you know what? Parks used to be fun when we were kids. Some things happened. Parks are not like before anymore. We don't enjoy it anymore. What we don't know is that parks are the same. We have changed. The universe out there, the parks, are the same as when we were kids, when we used to enjoy it too, when we were so excited as well. But now, something has changed inside us. We look at it, we don't enjoy it. How many times, honestly, have you even walked inside a park and you didn't even for one second pause to see the beauty of it? You were like just in your mind or thinking about what's happening. Because it doesn't even look beautiful. Why? Because there's something inside me. In the same way that my glasses reduce the brightness of the sky, there could be something inside us which reduces the joy, the pleasure we take out of life. So, this was the discussion we started yesterday. What's inside me changes the way I see the outside world. Now, there may be someone who is a little bit more scientifically oriented, they may be skeptic of these things. I want to say that even scientifically this is the case. So, what do I mean by that? Our brain, in order to see the world, okay? Our brain, you know, is hidden inside our skull, right? Like our brain is not out. Our brain is in a box inside our head. Right? It's stuck. Our head is around it. The skull is around it. So my brain has never touched a leaf or a tree. How does it see the outside world? For those of you who are more scientific, although this is like, I think, high school science. How do we see the outside world? Data from our sensory inputs. Right? So right now, how are you seeing me? So the light comes towards me, hits me, gets reflected back goes through your pupil, hits the retina, the optic pathway, goes to your visual cortex, and there your brain creates an image of me. That part probably you remember from high school, right? Light hits me, reflects back, goes through your pupil, then hits your retina, the optic pathway, and goes to your visual cortex. So this part is clear. For the brain, for us to see, one of the things which happens is that the data from the outside world comes in. But tonight I want to say that's not the only thing that happens. The brain doesn't just use the information that's coming right now to see what's in front of it. But it also uses what is already inside you. The information which you previously had so that it can make a better guess at what's outside. Let me, make you, let me give you an example. Um, have you ever seen this, that a father or a mother is working on a laptop, and they have a one-year-old or two-year-old that is crawling and sees the laptop and starts pushing the buttons? How many people have seen it? Say yes if you have. Yes, you have seen it? So. Both the parent and that one-year-old, two-year-old, they're seeing the same thing, a laptop. But they're experiencing it in different ways. What's happening? They are both getting the sensory input. The light hits the laptop and gets reflected to their eyes. So both the child and the dad 
in what they're receiving from the outside world, it's the same. But the child only sees the laptop as something fun to play with. Ooh, let me press that. Because that's all he knows. Ooh, I know games. This is game. Let's play with it. The father or the mother gets the same sensory input, but the brain uses that in addition to all the information this person has gathered in their life. That yes, I am working. For my work, I need to send an email. This is a laptop. I connect to internet with it. So all of that information, that there's something as work, there's something as technology, there's something as internet, there's something as email, helps the father that when he looks at the laptop, he's seeing something he uses for work. The child is seeing what? Something to play with. Now, you may be wondering, okay, that's an example, fair enough, but what about normal cases? Recite a salavot and I'll give you another example. Right now we're in this center. What am I trying to say? Your brain doesn't only use what's in front of you to see. It also uses all the information you have from before. Look at this center right now. We're in this beautiful center, Dar al Islam. Are we all seeing the same thing? Are we all experiencing it the same way? No. Even though the member is the same, the walls are the same, the chairs are the same. But based on what is inside us, we're experiencing it differently. So for me, this is a place where I have to deliver my lectures. For the brother who are organizing, this is the place when they look around, this is the place where they have to, for example, uh, serve God through their work. Now, there may be someone among us who, for example, had their engagement here, their act, a few years ago. Now they look at the center, for them it also has the taste of, oh, this is the place where we did our engagement in. The same center. Or maybe if you came here as a child, younger, with your parent, you're in the same center, but your experience is different. You also remember the memories you had with your parent when you came here. So do you see? Every one of us, we're in the same place, but we're having a different experience. So tonight I want to say that in life, we never see the world pure. We always bring everything that's inside us. We bring all of our life to every moment. How you feel tonight is not just ha what's happening right now. How you feel tonight was decided throughout your life. Tonight, we've come here at a night of God. We're listening to lecture. This part of it is the same for all of us. But how you feel depends on what is your memory of the nights of Qadr before? How your religious teachers treated you? What happened a few hours ago? What's going to happen later on if you're thinking about all of that? Right? So all the things which happened to you in your life, if, for example, previously sheikhs were nice to you, you're going to feel different about tonight listening to me. If there was a sheikh who was angry with you, it's going to change the taste of tonight. If you enjoyed Laylatul Qadr as a kid, now you're going to have a nicer taste. If you hated it as a, kid, as a kid, tonight it's going to be a little bit harder. Do you feel what I'm saying? At every single moment, we bring all of our life and we see what's in front of us. Now let me give you another example as well. Some of us could be scared of rats. Some of us could be scared of spiders. Some of us could be scared of birds. Okay? So, let's say there is a spider here in the center. We're all looking at the same spider. But I guarantee you our experience is going to be different. If previously nothing has happened with me about spiders, I'll just look at it and be like, okay, that's a spider. So I'll just see it. 
There could be another person in their house. For example, their parents were the kind of parents who as soon as they saw a spider, they were like, we have to kill it. It's bad. Let's kill it. God forbid. Don't kill spiders. You can put them on a tissue and take them out. But let's say someone was in a family that they killed the spider. Now that person looks at a spider. He sees a different thing. Oh, this is something I have to kill. Do you see? The first person just saw a spider because in their family, they didn't do anything. Another person sees a spider because in their family, they killed spiders. They're like, oh, this is something I have to kill. There could be another person who one day woke up, so he was sleeping, one day woke up, there was a spider on his face. He got really scared, and he has this fear inside him. He's going to be looking at spider, and oh, there's something scary there. So three people look at the same spider, three different experiences. One of them says, well, yeah, that's a spider. Interesting. And then move on. Another one's like, oh, that's a spider. We have to kill it. Another one's like, oh, that's a spider. It's scary. And in their brain, it's not like your brain tells you that is a spider because as children, our parents used to kill them, so let's kill it. No. Your brain tells all of that into one thing, and it tells you that's what's outside there, something you have to kill. Or for the other one who was scared, it says there is a scary object out there. So in neither of the cases, that's what, that's what was happening. That's just a spider. What happened to us previously changes the way we see it. The same is with everything, everything. Even when you have food. Even when you have food, what is food? It's a bunch of chemicals. Let's say you're having Doritos, pizza, biryani, dolma, bagala biddehin. I don't know what you're into. Whatever you're having, that's just some chemicals. Your brain creates the taste, but not just based on the chemicals, also based on what's inside you. This part is even scientifically proven. Professor Barrett has done a beautiful study. They've showed that if you love the person who's cooked the food, the food will literally taste different, will taste better. Because your brain is the one that creates the taste. And it doesn't just use what's in front of you. It also uses what's inside you. So if you love the chef, the food will taste better. And you must have seen this. If, for example, you go to grandma and you really love her, the food tastes nicer. But all you need to do is have an argument with grandma or have an argument with the one who's cooking the food. I just have to eat it. It doesn't taste good. Now, you'll see that when in the Quran, for example, we have man ya'mal mithqana dharratin khayran yara or dharratin sharran yara. Whoever does one little tiny bit of good or tiny bit of bad, they will see it. It doesn't just mean that in the hereafter you will see it. No. Even in this world, every single thing which has happened to you before will change the taste of the moments of your life for you. Every single thing which has happened to you, every single thing you've done, becomes a filter like these glasses that when you're experiencing the world, it changes the taste of it. Every single thing you've done. And that's why, for example, they say, forgive others in these nights of Qadr. Forgive. A lot of people say, but the person who hurt me doesn't deserve it. Don't forgive because of them. Forgive because of yourself. Why? Because if you keep anger, resentment inside, your brain will use this when it wants to understand the world. If I have anger, resentment, hurt inside, the world becomes a bitter place. And you won't even know that you would actually think you're in a bad place. You're in a bitter, painful, hurtful place. So when you forgive, the change of the, the taste of the world will change. Because whatever is inside you becomes a filter through which you see the world. Now I even have a quote that I say, if you forgive, even pizza tastes better, right? which I'm hoping, based on what we discussed tonight, you're convinced. 
Now, we discuss all of this why. The reason was this. We said we are in this world. It's difficult. It's painful. Life is tough sometimes, and we don't know why. On the other hand, we have people like Lady Zainab, who is in the same world, whose experience of life was even more difficult. She says, I'm seeing beauty. Or Imam Hussein, Ilahi, Ridan Begadaik, Tasleem and Lambrik. Lady Zainab, Imam Hussein, their life was so difficult. They're saying, God, we can see beauty here. God, we can see your love here. But we, with lives which are not as difficult, we can't see beauty. We can't see anything nice. Life is full of difficulty. We can't surrender to God's will. We can't accept what's happening to us. If an illness happens, if a difficult time comes, we're not going to accept it easily. No, we struggle. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? So this is why we're trying to figure out. How come they could do it, we couldn't do it? So the first thing we said is this, see, it's because of something which is inside us. Now let's talk about what is this thing which is inside us. If it's okay, please recite another salawat. So what is this thing inside us which is changing the taste of the world for us? Why is it that we're not enjoying the world? Let's see what happened. So yesterday we said, every insan goes through a cycle. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajaun. You are with God, everything is perfect. Then you're born, you come to this world. And even when you first come to this world, what is your experience like? When you first come to this world, as a child, life is beautiful. You have no worries. Even when you're in fight with someone, you don't hold grudges. Have you looked at children? They have a fight one minute, the next minute they're playing. So you can see that initially when we come to this world, events in life come and go, one experience after the other. We're playing, we're enjoying, even we have a fight, but we let go of the fight, we start playing again, right? A children, a child, sorry, is experiencing life one event after the other. In the morning they go to park, they're happy. They come home, they run around, they may get into a fight with a friend, a few minutes later they're playing. Everything comes and goes. Events of the life come and go. They don't hold any grudges. They don't hold on to anything. They don't have any expectations of what's happening. But then at some point, something happens which they can't let go. We can't let go. Something happens. Before this moment, the experiences came and go. Things were coming. I was watching TV, then I started drawing, then went to someone's house, came back. Events came and go. But then it, we reach a stage where something happens we can't let go. It's too difficult. Like what? Like, for example, I go to school or I go to nursery. Someone bullies me for my weight, for example. Oh, you're too fat. Oh, look at this. Before this, everything in life happened, and I would let go. It would come and go. But now something happened which I can't let go. I can't deal with. It's too difficult. They bullied me. I got real hurt. Now, when something like this happens, we can't let it go. We hold on to it in this way that we try to ignore it. We can't feel fully what's happening, we push it down, we suppress it, we want to avoid it. And then from that moment onwards, we are carrying it with us. We think we've ignored it, it's gone, but it's going to be there. 
maybe 10 years later, maybe 20 years later, you have gone to watch a movie with a friend. And you're at the cinema, you're watching a movie, and then a scene comes, you're feeling very good, you're excited, you're at the cinema, you're watching a movie, very happy. You're watching a movie, suddenly there's a scene in which they bully someone for their weight. Or maybe there's a person who's a little bit conscious about his weight. This triggers that memory you had all those years ago. And you feel bad about it. You don't even know. You don't, you've even forgotten that at once when you were a child, something bad happened, you pushed it down. No, you don't know. You think it's gone. But 20 years later, you're at cinema with your friends. You see something. It triggers that thing inside you. Suddenly, you feel awful. Like, guys, tonight I don't feel good. Let's, let's go back home. Now, why is this bad? Because this is just one example. Every single thing that happened in our life, we couldn't let go. It, we couldn't deal with. We couldn't handle. We're keeping them inside us as blockages. And in life, we keep getting triggered. Maybe, for example, you look at someone, they remind you of one of your insecurities. Maybe you, remind, you see someone, they remind you of one of your fears, and you feel bad, you feel bad. The same is with good things. So what was the first thing? We said with bad things, we don't let go, we hold on to them, they become part of us. What about good things? It can also be with good things. Let's say something good happens, and I don't let it go. Events were meant to come and go. But something good happens, I don't want to let it go. Now you may be asking, what's wrong with holding on to something good? Something bad, like fear, insecurity, I know why it's bad to hold on to it. But why about good things? Why should I hold on to good things? Because, let me give you an example. We, although we discussed the example yesterday, you're on the phone with a friend, you're really enjoying that discussion. Okay, and this is really good. The phone conversation finishes. Now, you have two choices. Either you say, that was a beautiful experience. I talked to my friend after three years. Oh, that was fun. We had so much fun. That was beautiful. You let go. You allow it to go and the next experience to come. Or you won't let go. Like, oh, that was so nice. I wish we could speak longer. You know, I wish we could speak longer, I really missed him. So you carry on engaging with it. What's wrong with that? You expect to have more of that, so when the next experience comes, you don't experience it fresh, you bring an expectation to it. So now the phone conversation is over, you're talking, for, for example, your wife comes in, or your husband. She wants to talk to you, but you're not talking to her. All you can think about is that phone conversation was so nice. Right? So when you hold on to something good, every moment from that point onwards, you want to see it. You're looking for it. Ooh, where can I see my friend again? Where can I see my friend again? So, so many things happen, but you're not paying attention. And people are wondering, why is it that I can't see, uh, why is it that I don't enjoy the universe? Because imagine if this is just one example of holding on to something, We've been holding on to things for 20, 30 years. Uh, please recite the salawat. <laughs> Am I right in thinking you're a little bit low energy tonight? Is that correct? How are you feeling, by the way? How are you feeling? Can you speak louder a little bit? I can't hear you. You're feeling okay? Alhamdulillah, yeah? Because I'm looking at you from here, I'm like, they can't wait to get some sleep. Is that the case? Yeah? Well, get some sleep, honestly. Because I want to look at some people who, who are a little bit more energetic, believe me. Should I, I don't know what can I do for you. Should I make you coffee? Should I make you tea? Would you like honestly? By the way, there's uh, tea there. If you want, you can make for yourself, get some energy, feel free. Lest they've spent all that energy. And they even got these biscuits, which I love, the cream ones. Did you try them? 
It's really nice. Honestly, if you're sleepy, get up. Don't, don't, don't feel bad about it. Go make yourself a cup of tea, then come back, sit down. I want you energetic. See, night of God, if you come here and then yawn and go home, nothing's going to change. We need some energy. We need to create a change, and for that, we need to be on our A game, okay? Just before my lecture, uh, the brother was reading that beautiful dua, right? That part of it was so beautiful. It said, God, you don't even need me, but you pay so much attention to me. I, 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 I need you so much, but I keep ignoring your call, right? And it really got to me. I was like, wow, how beautiful God is. Now, we, we really need to change. We really need help with our life. There's so much we need to fix. And if you want to fix it, it needs some energy. So give me some energy so that I can get energy from you so that we can... By the way, uh, no, I'm not going to say this one. I'm, sh- I'm oversharing. I'm not going to say this one thing, but shall I maybe tomorrow I'll share it with you. So what are we saying so far? Why is it that we're not enjoying the world? Because there's something inside us. What is this thing which is inside us? The events in their life, in our life, which we couldn't let go of, which we held on to, either bad or good. And then they remain with us for the rest of our life. Sometimes, by the way, this is not even our fault. So none of this that I'm saying is trying to judge you. It could also be the case that maybe as a child you were scared. You didn't know how to deal with that fear. You went to your parent. Dad, this happened, I'm scared. And your dad, bless him, out of good intentions. But he didn't know how to deal with a situation like this. So he told you, he tried to distract you. Oh, you're scared? Let's go buy you an ice cream. Now he thinks he's doing something good. But what's happening is that you didn't learn to deal with that fear. You distracted yourself from it. So it stays there with you. Now if the same thing happens next time, the same thing you were scared of, you're going to even feel more scared. And you can carry that with yourself. There are some people who, for example, in their childhood fell from a bike, a bicycle. They got really scared. They didn't know how to deal with it. And they went to their parents crying, shivering. Their parents didn't know how to help their child handle that pain, that stress. So they tried to distract them. You know what? You don't need to ride that bicycle anymore. It's okay, it's okay. Let's go, let's go. Now what happens is that this child hasn't dealt with that fear of bicycles. So next time she sees a bicycle or he sees a bicycle, she's going to feel scared again. And if the parents don't know that, see, she has to deal with this. Let's help her find a way. They're like, okay, okay. Don't think about bicycles. We'll give it away. We'll give it to your friend. We'll take it out. This just means that this person will carry this fear with them. Later on, not only they will never ride bicycle anymore, but maybe even as a parent when the child grows up, they won't even be comfortable with their children riding bicycles. You see, one small thing happens as a child, you don't let go, it can for another generation affect you. Now this is why we said Imam Hussein in Dua Arafah, what does he say? He says, Ilahi, in Nahtilafa Tadbirika was Sura at a Tawa Magadirik, Manara Ibadikal Arifinabik and his Sukun Ila Ata, while Yasemin Kafi Bala. Imam Hussein says, See, the ones who are a little bit spiritually more mature, they have seen in life things come and go, experiences come and go. You have an illness, then it goes. Some person is in your life, then it goes. You're so close with someone, then it goes. Or maybe there's a difficulty in your life, it finishes. Imam Hussein says, people who have seen this thing about life, that life doesn't wait for anyone, life comes and goes, 
they don't hold on to bad things anymore. And Danny, they don't, they are not that scared of bad things. They may be in pain, it may be difficult, but they let it go. And also the good things, they don't obsess over it. They let it go. So this is the main problem that happened with us. Good things came, we, sh we hold on to them. Bad things came, we buried them inside. And one good example that can show this would be what? Imagine, your, think of yourself as a TV screen, okay? Because we said events of life come and go, and you experience them. Now think of yourself as a TV and the life experiences as movies which are being shown on this TV. Okay? Now, one experience comes in our life. For example, now we're in this center. In a few minutes, this experience would finish. Something else will happen. So we're like a TV that at each point, a movie is being shown on it. Now, if we experience this movie, this experience we have right now, we go through it, it finishes, finishes, we'll watch the next movie, there's no problem. Something bad happens, you're sad, you grief, it's all okay, but you let go. Something good happens, you enjoy, you let go. It's very beautiful, it's as if there's a movie on a screen, movie finishes, you watch the other movie. But now imagine if a movie plays, it's too difficult, you can't handle it, you don't let it go. Or if it's too good, you don't let it go. It stays on the screen. Then the next movie comes. So now the previous movie is still there, and the new movie has come as well. So two movies on top of each other. Which is exactly what's happening to us right now. If, for example, an hour earlier you had an argument with someone, and you didn't let that go, now you're here listening to me, but you're also arguing with that person in your mind. So two experiences on top of each other. This lecture and that argument before. And now imagine if we do this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, how many things are in, on top of each other? Because for all of these years, every time someone broke our heart, every time someone hurt us, every time someone bullied us, every time someone... Uh, or every time we were so in love with something we didn't let go, all of that become things on top of each other that as we're experiencing the new thing, all of that is there too. So, the verse in the Quran says, well, there's a very beautiful verse in the Quran which talks about this very beautifully. It says, لَكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ Says, see, an imam, we have a few hadiths from the imams that this is one of the highest form of zuhd. We even have a hadith that if you want to summarize Quran in one verse, it's this verse. لَكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَكُمْ It says two qualities we need to learn to have. Not to push down, ignore, suppress the bad things in our life so much that we can't let go. And the second thing, not over excess with the good things, not over obsessed, sorry. The good things happen, enjoy them, but let them go. Right? So, what happens once we remove these blockages? Because I said, all the things that happened in our life, we're holding on to them. Inshallah, in your life, once you remove these, what happens is that you will see the same energy that you had as a child will come back. Because imagine right now as well, life energy is coming from God. We're all connected to God at the deepest part of our soul. God sending all of his love, all of his energy, life to us. But that energy, that life, that beauty is going through all of these things, all of these things which we have held on to. So by the time it reaches us, not much of it is left. Once you remove these, all of that love, all of that energy starts pouring in. 
And it's very interesting. You know, there's that beautiful poetry that says, do not seek love. Rather, remove the blockages inside you that stop you from experiencing love. You will see that. Once you remove all of these things which, you're, which you've held on to, you realize, oh, wow, there was so much joy, so much peace inside me that it, I, I couldn't experience. Khob. Allah, if you want more about this, I'm mainly saying for people at home or watching on YouTube because I don't seem like you guys are interested. But people who are watching later on on YouTube, I've spoken more about this. You can find it on our Instagram. I've opened this up, what happens. So inshallah, you can go and listen to that on more. It's called spiritual healing. Khob. I'll finish now. And because we're uh, remembering Imam Ali, I want to recite a few lines from Imam Ali alayhi salam, which uh, are attributed, these poetry lines are attributed to Imam Ali, and you can see that it's exactly describing what we were talking about tonight. It's very beautiful. And you will see what kind of a person we have missed. I really don't think most Shias know how great Imam Ali was. I really don't think so. I know that you, you say it, he was great. Ali yun ma'al haq wal haq ma'ali. But if someone asks you, tell me, tell the non-Muslim why he was great, believe me, you couldn't speak for 10 minutes. Believe me, you can't. He is so great. He is so amazing. But the way you can see if you understand his greatness or not is to try and see if you can talk about him to a non-Muslim. Because to a non-Muslim, you can't say, Ali on ma'al haq. He would say, well, that's a saying you believe in. You can't tell him that, for example, Qasim on nar wal jannah. He said, no, tell me a few things from him that changes your life. I really think Imam Ali is mazloom among us. Allah, these poetry are attributed to Imam Ali. And look, all the discussions we've been having, he said it how many centuries ago? So beautifully. And then, honestly, it will burn you that we're, we've lost such a beautiful person on a night like this. It says, what you need, the medicine you need to feel better is inside you and you can't see. What we've been discussing. And even the, the illness is also inside, you don't feel it. You look at the world like, why is the world painful? Why is the world scary? Why is the world bitter? Well, what, we, what have we been saying tonight? It's all inside. There are things inside us which don't allow us to enjoy the world. Do you think, do you think you're a small entity? No. You're a great universe. Everything you see outside, you're creating that experience. Exactly what we've been discussing tonight. How many years ago did he tell us what's the solution for our problems? Fix inside. It has um and a kajirmun sagir. Wafi can tawal alamul akbaru. Fa antel kitabul mubinu levi bi ahrufi of harul mudmaru. Imagine Imam Ali's voice coming from centuries ago telling you're so important. You give taste to the world. It's saying you're a book 
whose letters bring these hidden world into clarity. You're giving the world its picture, its form. You're creating. I wish we knew what he said. I wish we knew what kind of person we've lost tonight. فأنت الكتاب المبين الذي بأحرفه يظهر المضمر وما حاجة لك من خارج وما حاجة لك من خارج وفكرك فيك وما تصدر you keep thinking, you look at the world, it's scary, there's issue there, it triggers you and you want to change it. He says, all the solutions are inside, you don't need anything there. Come inside, change inside, everything will be fine. And then you can get to a place where like Lady Zainab, in front of her, the worst things are happening, what does she say? وَمَا رَأَيْتُ إِلَّا جَمِيلًا This is the kind of person we've lost. Imagine the voice of Imam Ali echoing through centuries, telling you, you're special. Everything you need is inside you. You're God's greatest creation. Take care of yourself. Fix it. And your experience of life will get better. This is the person we've lost tonight. Someone who gave the solution to our problems 14 centuries ago. Please recite the salawat.